Good morning, everyone. Uh, this session, we will be dis we will discuss the relationship between the First Amendment and pornography. This is, of course, a let's say delicate topic to say the least. It can suffer from two pitfalls. One being maybe a indiscreet discussion of substance. Uh, the other, a boring train of statutory and court citations. In the end, I hope to avoid both. And in so doing, I intend to show how this discussion partakes of something much bigger, uh, a conversation fundamental, I would say, to our polity and to our humanity. All right? Now, I will proceed along three lines. So if you feel like we're getting uh, uh, into the weeds, you can think about one of three things we're trying to get at. The first is I will discuss the First Amendment's purpose one grounded, I would say, in human anthropology, applying that purpose in anthropology to the pornography question. Second, I will seek to describe the current legal view of pornography's relationship to the First Amendment. That's, that's going to be a tough one. Uh, third and finally, I will briefly talk about what we can do to further the First Amendment's purpose in light of current legal parameters. So to begin the first point, I should just stake out my territory. I think that pornography not only stands outside of the First Amendment's protections, pornography violates the amendment's very purpose. And what I'd like to do is actually, let's just get the text in front of us, all right? The First Amendment says the following. Some of you may know it by heart. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This amendment, I would say, assumes, as I said before, an anthropology. By that, I mean it builds upon an understanding of what a human being is, doing so in two ways. First, I would say it assumes a human nature, our ingrained tendencies, even I'd say our essence. Second, relatedly, it assumes human purposes ends for which we as people exist. And I would say many of America's founders saw this. In fact, many of them said that man's ultimate end consisted in happiness. Now, I know we talked about happiness before, so bear with me. Um, John Adams, for example, wrote that, quote, the happiness of society is the end of government. As all divines and moral philosophers will agree, that the happiness of the individual is the end of man. Now, um, this purpose in felicity helps us to parse the First Amendment's provisions, I would say. We can split the text, and I tried to do this in the way I, 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 I put this on, on, on the PowerPoint, into two halves, each articulating a subset of the human end of happiness and the human nature existing to pursue it. The amendment's first half includes the establishment and free exercise clauses. The second consists of the protections for speech, press, assembly, and petition. Now the free exercise and establishment clauses recognize, I would say, our inherently religious nature. We naturally feel our creaturely status and seek to know our ultimate origins. This religious nature then presents, I'd say, an end for human life. Worship. And I would say worship we will, whether ourselves, others, or God. And I would say that if you look at the American founders, part of how they describe human happiness for most people will be the adoration of the last of the three options, not the first two. The remaining portion of the amendment, the speech, press, assembly, and petition clauses, assume our political nature. As we are inherently religious, we too are inescapably political. For our purposes, this, this point needs a little more unpacking. To explain our essence, we must turn back the clock to well before America. And I wrote an article discussing this a bit uh, in public discourse. Uh, the Greek philosopher Aristotle described us as by nature, uh, Dr. Wilcox was saying social animals, I would say uh, the translation can also be as political animals. This point, by the way, is true whether you have a political news addiction or can't name a single branch of our national government. By the way, a poll recently said one-third of Americans can't do that. Um, 
What does Aristotle mean, though, that makes both persons that I just mentioned, thus all persons, political? It begins with our ability to reason. And by reason, I mean that we possess the capacity to think abstractly and logically. By abstractly, reason does more than experience sense perception. It can categorize things into trees and cars, experiences into beautiful or just. By logically, we can follow a train of abstract ideas, doing so uh, to a, 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 a conclusion of some kind, from premise to conclusion. Together, I do more than discern that my toddler just stole my food off my plate. I can consider whether I deserved it or not, <laughs> that she stole it, right? Reason, by itself, though, doesn't make us political. Aristotle adds an additional, though, connected capacity, and that is speech. Speech is more than any sound, though, that our vocal cords make. Aristotle talks of mere voice that relates inarticulate grunts of agony or pleasure, like the noise I make when I stub my toe. Any animal does that. Speech, instead, vocalizes our reason. It communicates with others regarding the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's a phrase that gets tossed around my college all the time. The ability to speak is the prerequisite of our political nature. For what we, do we talk about? We possess speech not primarily to discuss the weather or our favorite track on Kanye's new album. God is. Um, Aristotle says that we think and we discuss justice as well as what is advantageous. We consider what is right in general and for ourselves. And by the way, the, 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 the latter should be in subservience to the former. Aristotle then completes this definition of political life by considering what we do with our discourse regarding the just and the advantage, advantageous. We form partnerships based on them. Put differently, we create communities, including political communities, with laws, mores, and institutions on the foundation of our reason, expressed through speech, based upon justice and the common advantage. Now, this political nature, I'd say, points to a human purpose. That purpose is found in the object of our speech and of our partnerships, justice. As our religious nature entails an end of worship, so our political nature points to the end of right thinking and action. In the just life, as in the worshiping one, we act humanly. In both, we pursue a, what I would say is true happiness. And I'd say the founders concurred in this view, thinking in the American context. Consider Federalist 51, where James Madison said that, and I'll quote this, justice is the end of government. It is the end of civil society. It ever has been and ever will be pursued until it be obtained or until liberty be lost in the pursuit. The First Amendment accords with this view of human nature and human purpose. Each protection it affords preserves and promotes our political essence. Each facilitates our purpose of justice. Of course, these connections apply most easily to freedom of speech, but they also form the groundwork for a free press, which involves speech committed to writing. It comprises the foundation for assembly, petition, and redress. Petition and redress are forms of speech dedicated to declaring and defending justice and the common good in some public forum. Assembly is a form of partnership based upon speech, I would say, in the Aristotelian sense. Now, the proceeding informs us, I would say, about pornography's relationship to the First Amendment. Rather than accord with man's nature and his rightful end, pornography disorders the first and thwarts the second. Aristotle, again, is helpful here to set this up. He says that if you are not a man, you are either a beast or a god. And I would say pornography drives you toward degrading forms of both. Take the religion clauses. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent enticed the first couple by saying, you shall be like God. Pornography is a particularly twisted manifestation of this lie. It does not point us to God, but makes distorted gods of ourselves, tyrannical gods at that. For in pornography, we demand degrading religious rituals be played out in accordance with our own fantasies. We therein pursue our own glory lauded by on-screen worshipers. We do so through control, moreover. We seek to recreate other human beings, 
made in the image of God, not in that image, but of the objects we desire to help us use for our own pleasure. And by the way, this is the same as true. I think the same vision comes out in the First Amendment's political portions. For one, I would say pornography is not speech, but deed. Um, this idea of free expression, maybe we can talk about in, in, in the Q&A, I think has distorted that. Pornography, moreover, subverts that political nature. To the degree it communicates, it descends, it consists of voice, it relays pleasure, but not in a human way. Instead, it descends, I'd say, into the bestial, the sub-rational, if not the irrational. It subsumes the primacy of reason for the subhuman passions. Moreover, it stands against the purpose for which we use our speech, for which we form political community. Our founders had a well-defined view of justice on which they formed our political partnership, our union. Not perfectly realized, but they had a firm idea of it. They grounded it in human equality, particularly in the possession of natural rights and the subsequent necessity of rule by consent. I know we talked about consent last night as well. But as pornography shapes us into tyrannical gods, so it denies others equality, even humanity. It forms communities, and I'd stretch that term, of use, really, of abuse. We deny others equal rationality. We deny others equal dignity. We deny their true consent and instead objectify them. By the way, something to which they never can rightly, I would say, consent in the first place. All told, pornography mocks the First Amendment's purposes, not falls under them. It does not offer true happiness, but instead offers degradation. It is fundamentally, in a sense, inhuman. And the inhuman, by the way, is worse when done by humans because of the human tools we use to accentuate, multiply its abuse. But I would say the proceeding doesn't quite fill out the argument of my first part. The First Amendment does point to humanity's religious as well as political nature and ends. Yet I've, admit, I've admitted a crucial textual commonality between them, one I'm sure if you've gotten into debates about this, you've heard. That word is freedom. We possess the right to freely exercise religion. We possess the right to speak, write, assemble, and petition freely. One might say that word lays waste to my preceding argument. Surely freedom in these matters does not foreclose pornography. In fact, freedom demands its inclusion, its protection. Can we not find religious exercise steeped in overt, ritualized uh, sexuality? And by the way, very much of uh, many religions in the history of the world have had cult prostitution, have had very overt uh, uh, sexuality attached to it. Can we not see expression in adult material? The First Amendment may open the possibility of other pursuits, even hope for them, but does it really foreclose adult material? We must then, what that demands is define freedom. But here we encounter a difficulty. Other than perhaps equality, our political community engages in no more pervasive and entrenched definitional battle than over freedom. Try to find the self-defined anti-liberty party, for example, in our politics. Now, of course, we'll always accuse our political opponents of being anti-liberty, but the self-defined one. Nor, by the way, is this challenge unique to us. The 18th century French political thinker Montesquieu, very influential on the American founders, declared, quote, no word has received more different significations than has struck minds in so many ways as has liberty. On any given an issue, whether abortion, taxes, healthcare, you'll find two, if not 10 different views. All of them will claim freedom's mantle. No different in this discussion. But what I would say is that uh, the American founders did not define freedom, as some do, as the capacity to do whatever one desires. The Constitution's framers and ratifiers never envisioned the morally autonomous individual whose will established justice's contour, something like the uh, passage that some of you may be aware of in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, what Justice Scalia called the uh, sweet mystery of life passage, right? Uh, instead, freedom involved conforming to our nature and in so doing, pursuing our purpose. An acorn is not enslaved by becoming an oak tree. It thereby acts according to its nature and obtains its purpose. It therein is made whole, complete. So with human beings. 
The founders pointed to a particular set of qualities as the means to rightly conform to our nature and thus to pursue true happiness. And that is the virtues. Justice, moderation, prudence, courage. These characteristics oriented the practicing, habituating purpose toward real happiness. And we see this connection between virtue and happiness throughout the founding writings. Uh, Without virtue, happiness cannot be, Thomas Jefferson said. Washington, in his first inaugural, declared, quote, there exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. The founders then took this connection between virtue and happiness to help define freedom. Benjamin Franklin added that, quote, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. James Madison asserted, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea, right? I think I said that wrong. All right, um, uh, I always tell my students, one word I couldn't pronounce coming from Appalachia to college was color. I said collar, and I literally could not get myself to say the word collar. I had to uh, train myself in the mirror. Okay, that's, that won't be on the exam, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, and and I would say that this is true, all true, not pronunciation, uh, because freedom is not no government. It ultimately resides in self-government. It is not to act according to no law, but according to just law. An addict is not free. The one disciplined to self-control is. Freedom, in other words, is part of the definition of virtue. Virtue is part of the definition of freedom. I would add that the First Amendment's two halves work together on this broader point. The moral component of freedom connected closely to religious adherence. John Adams, our second chief executive, and part of this quote will be very familiar, asserted that we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. This is the famous part. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Washington's farewell address called for a similar point. He said, quote, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on the minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience, Both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Now, by the way, I just want to say, for those who might not be religious in the room, he didn't mean that atheists couldn't be moral, but he meant that building a public morality needs all the help it can get, including religious principle. These should be enough to answer the freedom objection regarding pornography, if not push me in Q&A. Uh, Pornography may fit a boundless freedom to do whatever one wishes, but it bears no resemblance to the freedom articulated by our founders and encapsulated in the First Amendment. To take each of the four primary virtues listed above, pornography is patently unjust, for as previously discussed, it treats others as objects for use. It treats the self as bestial or a tyrannical god. Pornography is patently cowardly, It avoids the often difficult task of real human relationships based upon mutual respect and mutual care. Pornography is manifestly immoderate, it is greedy, unrestrained, giving into the worst of passions. And finally, I would actually say pornography is imprudent. It not only denies the justice underlying prudence, it often is oblivious to the damage or uncaring to the damage it does to others and to the consumer. Yet, by the way, I, I would just say that that might even give pornography too much credit. For it isn't even self-government in the autonomous, self-defining sense. It may seem like autonomy, the self-creation, self-definition that many define liberty to be in our day and age. But instead, it is a, a deadly drug, an addiction that, while perhaps at first freely chosen, can and does quickly descend into a kind of enslavement. How fitting, by the way, that such actions that oppress others in mind, if not in action, would forge chains for the oppressor. In pornography, the consumer is both slave and master, but I would say but much more the former. Now I now turn, having laid out that vision, to present reality, 
How, how does current legal doctrine stack up to this perspective? And positively, we can find affirmations of the preceding vision. For one, we see the Supreme Court centering the First Amendment's purpose in protection of political speech. The examples here are legion. Really, any free speech case will allude to this point, if not make it directly. For another, until the 21st century, the courts upheld morality as a legitimate, a beneficial purpose of legislation. The traditional categories of police powers in the states always included morals regulations alongside protections of health and safety. Federal government powers, too, could seek to curtail at least publicly immoral objects and actions within its own sphere, things like interstate commerce or federal mails. Judges understood free speech in line with these understandings. In Chaplinsky versus New York, that's a 1942 case, the court observed that, quote, it is well understood that the right of free speech is not absolute at all times under all circumstances. There are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech, the prevention and punishment of which have never been thought to raise any constitutional problem. The court stated that, quote, these include the lewd and the obscene, the profane, am among others they list. Thus, there are ways of communicating or things communicated that due to their lewd and obscene nature do not deserve constitutional protection. In explaining this point, the court gave an almost Aristotelian answer. It has been observed, they said, that such utterances are no essential part of any exposition of ideas. In other words, in my own words, freedom of speech protects exercises of reason, communicating concepts, arguments, beliefs. It was drawn up for political man acting politically. Furthermore, the court touched upon the issue of morals. Some communication may be, and I'll quote again, of such slight social value as, to step, as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. Reason and morality, the intellectual and the moral virtues, were the goal of the First Amendment, they basically said. The category obscenity became then the focus for discussing the place of pornography within or without the First Amendment. If pornography was obscene, then it stood outside the First Amendment. If not, then perhaps its protection had some constitutional basis. So we're back to definitions. First, what exactly is obscene? Here we must wade deeply into the legal um, swamp, I would say, of obscenity doctrine. Three judicial tests were articulated between the late 1950s and the early 1970s, each trying to define obscenity for the sake of government regulation. The first major case was 1957's Roth versus United States. All right, Roth was convicted of mailing out basically dirty circulars, advertisements, as well as a sexually explicit book uh, to unsuspecting persons in the mail. The majority rightly pinpointed the purposes of First Amendment freedoms. Justice Brennan declared that, quote, the protection given speech and press was fashioned to assure unfettered interchange of ideas for the bringing about of political and social changes desired by the people. This case furthermore denied obscenity as falling within First Amendment protection. The court noted that, and I'll quote again, implicit in the history of the First Amendment is the rejection of obscenity as utterly without redeeming social importance. This rejection for that reason is mirrored in the universal judgment that obscenity should be restrained, end quote. Though not using the term, this reasoning touched on the moral judgment rendered by society against obscenity, and that such moral rejection permitted even demanded prohibition. But again, how did the court define this category? And this is what I have up here uh, in a second. He says, Brennan cautioned first, as a preliminary matter, that, quote, sex and obscenity are not synonymous. And to a degree, I think we should agree with that statement. He explained that, quote, a great and mysterious force, motive force in human life, has indisputably been a subject of absorbing interest to mankind throughout the ages. It is one of the vital problems of human interest and public concern. Pornography is wrong, I would say, not because sex is wrong. It is wrong because it takes a good thing and distorts it for evil. Thus, we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Room must exist for healthy, upright discussion of sex, for we were made to be sexual, but in the proper manner. 
So how is obscenity distinct from healthy sexual in, uh, material? Here's what I've now got up, uh, got up here. The court defined obscenity as whether the average person applying contemporary community standards, the dominant theme of the material taken as a whole appeals to purient interest. So we must take the perspective of the norm, an average person acting in line with the current standards of a community. From that perspective, we must ask two questions. First, does the work appeal to purient interest? Uh, or actually, this is the main one. Purient is defined, by the way, as something, quote, marked by or arousing an immoderate or unwholesome interest or desire. Um, second, though, uh, uh, the second point to make is that it cannot be that a portion of the debated work does so. Instead, it must be the work taken as a whole, the dominant or pervasive element. And then Brennan added that implicit in the history of the First Amendment is that rejecting this obscenity means it's utterly without redeeming social importance. Here we had our first test of obscenity. One I would add that I think easily permitted the prohibition of pornography, at least wholly pornographic works. But it would not be our last. Uh, Justice Harlan the Younger, there were two Justice Harlans, would describe it as, quote, the intractable obscenity problem. So the next major case to tackle obscenity was uh, 1966's Memoirs versus Massachusetts. This litigation concerned the novel Fanny Hill, which was written in England by one John Cleland in 1750. Massachusetts banned it as an obscene book, and by the way, don't read it, but it consists mostly of describing in extensive detail a woman's work at a brothel. Here, the court's three-part test both affirmed Roth's declaration and diverged from it. In affirmation, obscenity meant, uh, and this is where I think it affirms Roth, meant that, quote, the dominant theme of the material taken as a whole appeals to purient interest in sex. But the court added two additional, I would say, uh, somewhat restrictive criteria. First, quote, that the material must be uh, patently offensive because it affronts contemporary community standards relating to the description or representation of sexual matters. Here we see that material not only dominantly, that material must not only dominantly appeal to negative sexual interest, it must be patently offensive, seemingly uh, upping the ante of how bad it must be. The third point I would say also modified Roth, obscenity must only apply when, quote, the material is utterly without redeeming social value. This meaning, this meaning, uh, this meant any showing of positive good would save it from being categorized as obscene. And I'd say these added criteria presented several significant, even overwhelming problems. Uh, the second prong is hard to define. What's patently offensive, while, steering, while, while still appearing to permit a much wider allowed sexual content. The third begs the question of whether pornography even contains ideas, much less redeeming ones. Moreover, the practical difficulty here is that it forced legislators and prosecutors to prove a negative. Imagine how easy it is to suggest that even the most depraved pornography has some redeeming social value. Perhaps its use of sound and camera angles evokes a new approach to the medium of film. Perhaps near the scenes portrayed rests a copy of the US Constitution or a picture of Galileo, right? Um, I, I haven't proven this because I didn't want to try to, but I had a professor once tell me that uh, a, a pornography after this would try to have something like that, like someone's reading Plato's Republic before the actual point of the, of the film starts, right? Um, and, 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 and so that presented a huge problem. And uh, I would say thankfully, although uh, memoirs didn't last. Instead, the controlling case today remains 1973's Miller versus California. That decision also posited three criteria. The first one also followed, I would say, uh, Roth and, and memoirs. Uh, number one, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work as a whole appeals to prurient interests. The second, I would say, basically followed memoirs as well whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. The change, I would say, came in the third, and this is at least partially welcome, regarding materials connection to social value. The court said that one must determine, quote, whether the work taken as a whole 
lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. I think hopefully you see the switch there. The court consciously rejected the stand of, standard of proving the negative, of utterly without redeeming social value. Instead, it set up a standard of whether the work, comprehensively considered, failed to show serious value in the realm of ideas. So at least the painting of Galileo on the bedroom wall wouldn't cut it, right? Something. <clears throat> uh, and, and to step back, um, I would say that you, know, you see some affirmation of the centrality of ideas in the, uh, here. You see uh, some upholding of a moral claim that moral judgments still remain, that freedom involves some kind of virtue. For these cases, sometimes in spite of themselves, all ultimately require some moral judgment regarding the portrayal of sex. Take whether the litigated materials appeal predominantly to a prurient interest. Remember that uh, prurient is defined as something, quote, marked by or arousing an immoderate or unwholesome interest or desire. But notice what that assumes. That means that we must have some concept of moderate, wholesome sexual desire by which to compare these materials. Or consider that obscenity is um, patently offensive regarding sexual matters. In, in fact, in Roth, uh, uh, Justice Brennan quoted the trial judge of the lower court as saying that, quote, the words obscene, lewd, and lascivious um, as used in the law sig signify that form of immorality which has relation to sexual impurity and has a tendency to excite lustful thoughts. In other words, sexual purity and impurity are distinguishable. Lustful thoughts are pernicious. In fact, another later case, this is from 1985, uh, Brockett v. Spokane, spoke of, quote, a shameful or morbid interest in sex, meaning, again, that we can, even should discern between a normal, healthy interest in sex and an abnormal one, and that material we judge can be judged by that standard. That all said, I, and you'll see even more as I go along, I don't think too highly of how the court has then applied these standards to the issue of pornography. And let's turn to some of those next, for as we defined obscenity, we must try to define pornography in relation to it. And when I say try to, I mean try to define it as has been defined legally. Uh, taken in themselves, I would say, as, as a, a preliminary note, that a good argument exists saying pornography violates each of the three criteria that I have up here in Miller versus California. Does it appeal to prurient interest? Yes. <laughs> How is something created to exhibitionize sex into a product for viewing not so? Is it patently offensive in its sexuality? Yes, I'd say for much the same reason as it makes the intimate pr public, the private common, in a way that degrades our bodies and our souls. Is it finally without serious social value? My part one hopefully shows it is worse, it is a serious social harm. But Miller added two explanations of the test that would create more confusion as well as restrict attempts at pornography regulation. For one, the court added the following toward the end of the opinion, quote, under the holdings announced today, no one will be subject to prosecution for the sale or exposure of obscene materials unless those materials dis depict or describe patently offensive, quote, hardcore sexual conduct specifically defined by the regulating state law as written or construed. Now, if you're gonna create a category of hardcore pornography as obscene, then what does that, does that mean material could be pornographic and fall outside the obscenity category? I, I don't think they were clear on that. Uh, a second point, the court, I would say very awkwardly, so I'm not gonna quote it, gives some examples of patently offensive material, basically speaking of the exhibition of what it calls ultimate sexual acts and nudity that includes um, everything, we'll just say. Um, this description, I'd say, also at least gave the impression, although I don't think it has to be defined this way, that some sexual acts being portrayed might fall outside obscenity. So to deal with these elaborations, courts and legislators have distinguished between obscenity and material considered indecent. Those non-hardcore ultimate portrayals uh, fall, at least the, uh, the argument is, outside of obscenity. And this distinction mattered on the court because in cases like Sable Communications versus FCC, this is from 1989, the court declared that, quote, sexual expression which is indecent but not obscene is protected by the First Amendment. 
Limits may be placed on time, place, and audience, more on those later, but not on the content itself, it seems. Uh, and Justice Scalia was helpful in this, in that case. He noted that the problem is we actually still don't have a good line separating sexually uh, material that has sex in it that is indecent from that which is obscene. Uh, uh, often in these, they talk about you know, movies that aren't themselves pornographic as being what's uh, uh, considered maybe indecent but not obscene. But he claims that because we don't have a firm grasp on that, we're not quite as bad as Justice Potter Stewart. He's the one that famously said about pornography, I can't really tell you what it is, but I know it when I see it. Um, that, that's a way to punish the courts, right? because uh, 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 then what happens? Everything has to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, but courts have had a difficult time parsing these matters. Some judges have sought to place uh, a lot of pornography out s within obscenity. Scalia, I think, was one of these. Uh, other courts have assumed but not defined that some pornography is indecent and thus protected by the First Amendment, uh, including there was a case about the Playboy Channel where they, they didn't directly say so, but they assumed. Uh, still others have tried to establish objective criteria to distinguish between hard and soft core pornography. Some have in practice just thrown their hands up. And by the way, the, the, the clearest line has been on one front, banning uh, non-simulated child pornography. That's actually where a lot of the prosecutorial effort has been, even though I would say it's not the only place where pro prosecution can happen. In the absence of clarity, I would say too many reasonable curbs on pornography either have been struck down or not even attempted by states. And this uh, confusion, I think it's confusion. I think that more can be done that, than is being done by a good deal. Uh, uh, it's really been the problem of confusion. So these definitions being made somewhat, uh, I now turn to what courts have said we can do in regulating obscenity, however defined. And here I'd first turn to questions of possession versus distribution. Regarding possession, the main case from the Supreme Court is Stanley versus Georgia. This is from 1969. You might think that if obscenity fell outside the First Amendment, it could be banned entirely. Uh, you'd be wrong. Uh, this case held that the First Amendment prohibited the government from banning private possession of obscene material. Here, uh, police found pornographic films in a man's room while executing a search warrant uh, for evidence that the man was actually a bookie. The state of Georgia argued that since obscenity was outside the First Amendment, states were free to regulate it as needed, subject only to other restrictions in the Constitution. The court grounded its decision, actually though not in saying obscenity is okay, that it can't be banned, but in the right to privacy. It began by affirming the right to receive information and ideas. Fine. Uh, but in a somewhat meandering train of thought, it said the following. First, an idea of privacy of content that the right includes, uh, to privacy includes the capacity to receive any ideas regardless of their social worth. Second, privacy of location. The court added the right to be free, except in very limited circumstances, from unwanted government intrusions into one's privacy. It then put these two concepts together to side against Georgia. Stanley was, quote, asserting the right to read or observe what he pleases, the right to satisfy his intellectual and emotional needs in the privacy of his own home, end quote. Now, there are at least two problems with this reasoning. The court argues that private possession of pornography can fall within satisfying intellectual and emotional needs. I don't think I need to say why I find that risable, given what I've said before. We're not talking ideas, and we're not talking legitimate fulfillment of emotional needs. Furthermore, it changes the obscenity standards for private possession. Any idea, really anything, is okay, not merely those having some or serious social value. But then an interesting thing happened. You could say that's checkmate. One might think that a right to possess might entail a right to distribute, to sell. After all, if you have a right to a certain end, then you'd have the right to necessary means for its fulfillment. But you'd be wrong again. Uh, the court has actually said, including in a 1971 case, United States versus Rydell, that uh, you can ban transportation, distribution, and sale of all mis obscene material, even if people want it for private use. In other words, it's interesting. Uh, you might have a right to, to possess it. You don't have a right to get it. You can ban the actual provision of it, even if you can't, st you can stop the demand, even uh, you, uh, you can't stop the demand, but you can maybe break off the supply. And the court explained why the state could, 
even should do so in Paris Adult Theater No. 1 versus Slayton. This is in 1973. Again, this is Georgia. Georgia was attempting to stop a cinema from showing pornographic films. The court considered whether a right existed to commercial access to them, really to any access to them if given by someone else. The justices confirmed that no right existed even for adults, any, and any attempt to buy or sell made it commercial. Uh, in fact, in most ways of distributing made it commercial. The justices' reasoning here is worth noting. They found, and this is, I think, a step in the right direction, that there are, quote, legitimate state interests at stake in stemming the tide of commercialized obscenity. This point was true regardless of age, even if you by other means could stop exposure to minors or unwilling persons. You could stop it from even willing persons. Here we see more glimpses of the founders' freedom view of freedom, and one that I think should interpret or help interpret Miller in, I think, a more positive way. Chief Justice Berger, the opinion's author, author um, spoke of the right of the nation and of the states to maintain a decent society. This concept of a decent society proved important, for he then elaborated, describing what he considered to be a decent society and one that people could regulate toward. It began with protection of all. He said that legitimate purposes could include the interest of the public in the quality of life, in the total community environment, and possibly in the public safety itself. See, pornography involves behavior that preys on others even as it degrades the self. Trafficking, for example, is among the worst, but far from the only form of abuse aided and abetted by the porn industry. As we've seen, by the way, if you've been following the news very recently. Such evil attacks the life and the liberty of so many. Second, Chief Justice Berger looked to, quote, the social interest in, mor so in order and morality. A decent society was a moral and an ordered one. Berger gave some qualities of this moral, ordered, decent society. In addition to the safety noted above, the political community can act on goals to, quote, lift the spirit, improve the mind, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, improve the mind, enrich the human personality, and develop character. Laws can do more than protect the body or stop actions. They can guard, even cultivate the soul. I'd say they should guard and cultivate the soul. Importantly, this legislative capacity exists even absent determinative empirical proof of the connection between obscenity and the good sought. You can't say, well, I found my s study that says one thing about pornography, you found yours, therefore the tie goes to permissiveness. He actually says no. Instead, he says, the sum of experience, including that of the past two decades, affords an ample basis for legislatures to conclude that a sensitive, key relationship of human existence Central to family life, community welfare, and the development of human personality can be debased and distorted by crash a commercial exploitation of sex. Law could declare obscenity, and I'd say pornography, debasing, distorting of the individual and the family and the society. Law could ban its sale and distribution to thwart such debasement and encourage its opposite. And I'd add that pornography fits the bill here in every respect. Now, this does mean, by the way, that in addition to content restrictions, there are restrictions on who can consume it, specifically children, but even adults in the instances I mentioned. There are limits on location. Uh, we can severely restrict what locations are uh, uh, open to pornography. We can uh, do so in ways that deny, that make sure that only consenting persons go to it, if any at all. Um, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that if you want. Uh, the, the sort of, the, uh, um, the, the cases are legion on that. There's, there's just all these criteria of, of, of how you determine those things, but the court has always left that open. Um, so, so hopefully you see a little bit that um, while there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of resources to push the legal position of what can be done for, for pornography. And I'm not saying the court is going to be, especially the Supreme Court's going to be perfect on this. Uh, uh, Kennedy leaving might be helpful. Um, and I can talk about why maybe if you want. Uh, uh, but the, the, the fact that, um, that you have these resources and these opinions, I think, allows us to push more than we have and be more active than we have been uh, at, at the legal level.
And that brings me to third and finally, uh, how I'd consider what to do in the future. Um, and doing so requires bringing together those first two points. Given the state of obscenity jurisprudence, what might we do to approach the First Amendment's vision of human nature and human purposes? I focus on three areas. Access, assent, ag uh, advocacy has to be alliterative. Uh, first, cutting off access. And I don't think uh, we're going to have to be a, a little careful about whether we can get courts to define all pornography as obscenity at the moment. I, I think that's going to be a debated proposition. Though I think long term we must. We must make the argument that I was making in the first part to reco by recovering our history, by recovering our grounding in moral right. But here and now, we can really cut down on access to it in important ways. And the gra greatest battlefield, of course, is the internet. As most of you are on college campuses, let's focus there. An important case on this point is United States versus American Library Association in 2003. You might want to wield this on people. Uh, that case discussed why the government could require libraries to use internet filters to block pornographic sites, by the way, all pornographic sites, as a condition of receiving certain funding. The majority argued that, quote, public libraries pursue the worthy missions of facilitating learning and cultural enrichment, end quote. What it provides regarding resources partakes of its, quote, traditional role of obtaining material of requisite and appropriate quality for educational and informational purposes. And by the way, I think the same could and should and must be said about colleges and universities. They exist to facilitate learning and cultural enrichment. If so, then those institutions possess the power to ban access to pornography as antithetical to their purpose. The more filters, the better. <laughs> And by the way, this line of reasoning was more explicitly upheld in the district court case of Loving versus Boren. This is all the way back in 1997. That litigation out of Oklahoma affirmed the power of universities to install internet filters to block certain content and to police that, including pornography. As the school provided internet access, the provision was its property. And schools could regulate its use in accordance with institutional purposes, especially in prohibiting access to sexually explicit material. By the way, that is a case you can take back home with you. Second, we can require assent as much as possible. We can make um, engaging in, in, in viewing these activities as conscious and obvious as possible. We can zone access to adult stores, uh, to other adult material, as far away from campus as possible. We can fight the showing of ex sexually explicit material, uh, sex week escapades, and other things. Uh, and I'd add, by the way, there's strength in numbers here. The more people who don't want exposed to it, the harder we can make it uh, to show. And that leads to my final point that will close me out, uh, advocacy. We must be about much more than regulating, even banning pornography. Laws and regulations matter. They can and should aid in limiting access and thus consumption. But even as we regulate supply, we still must address demand. We must persuade persons to willingly, decisively reject um, this scourge, indecent or obscene, however the court defines it. In fact, I'd say this is the most helpful and long-running option. Returning to Montesquieu, you should all read Montesquieu. Uh, modifying mores toward justice is even better than harsh punishments, even if punishments are necessary. He actually says, harsh punishments are a result of a failure of legislation, not a good legislation in itself. And this point returns me to the vision articulated at the beginning of my talk. The critique of pornography must be part of something bigger. The rejection of pornography must be the acceptance of something else, something better. It circles back to an understanding of what it means to be human. It is an understanding of humanity grounded in our religious and political nature. It is a humanity that pursues true happiness by exercising reason according to these natures to worship and pursue justice. It is one assumed and pursued by the founders and their first amendment. That is truly human. That should be our vision, our discussion, our mission. So I'd say in closing, let us work together toward this common mission. For there are so many broken and being broken by this inhuman and inhumane scourge on our society and on our lives. Let us devote ourselves to the task ultimately of healing. Let us articulate passionately and reasonably the ultimate rejection of pornography, 
telling our fellow human beings, be who you are, be who you were created to be. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.